We all have events in our lives that take an outsized memory. They take on a sort of weight or meaning far beyond what you think they would deserve. But that's how memory works. Such it is that I'm able to think almost 30 years later about the greatest nap I ever took. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Jeff Atwood, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. This nap occurred in my late 20s. At the time, I was living in Boston, and I would take, on occasion, a two- or three-hour trip west into the Catskill area, where my family's farm was, and where we would often have Thanksgiving around the table of a farmhouse. By the time I was in my late 20s, I was well ensconced in computers, working at a specialized data center that had a small number of customers with a huge amount of demands. I lived in an apartment by myself on the bottom floor of a house, and when I would travel to see my family, it was almost always along Interstate 90, with a small trip south on the Taconic Parkway and ending up at my family's farm. Such it was on this one Thanksgiving that I had driven for two or three hours after having worked, no doubt, throughout the night trying to shore things up so I could go away for the holidays. And when I got there, I was feeling perhaps under the weather with some sort of fatigue, and I hugged my grandparents, I hugged my mother, and I wandered to the back of the house with its packages and pieces of history and I went into one of the guest rooms, and I laid down for a nap. I did this on a Wednesday afternoon of a Thanksgiving weekend, having already fought traffic to get there, and I woke up on Thursday morning. And by wake up, I mean that I realized I had slept through the night, considered how comfortable the bed was, and then fell asleep again. I was woken up at 3 p.m. by my mother, who was, I assure you, extraordinarily displeased that her eldest son had come in and had basically gone to sleep. I was woken at 3 because it was time for Thanksgiving dinner, which we ate early. And so I sat down a little woozy, talked to people, enjoyed the usual delicious stuffing and gravy and different members of my family talking. And after a while, I wandered back to that bed, that beautiful, puffy bed with its white covers with small, exquisite stitching in it, and I fell asleep again. I woke up on Friday <laughs> to my mother, extraordinarily furious at how things had worked out, where her son had come in, gone to sleep, and had basically spent the next 24 hours sleeping, except for, of course, to feed like some sort of creature. The rest of Friday was normal, seeing my family, going out for a small amount of shopping in Hudson, New York, and eventually, towards the evening, getting into my car over the protestations of my family and driving home. That Thanksgiving, in some ways, was wasted, completely lost to me. And while I had many other Thanksgivings beyond that with my family, that was the one that really stuck with me. I've tried to figure out why did I go to sleep for almost 36 hours, turning what should have been a light nap into a coma. In the transition of my early 20s to my early 30s, I wasn't sure what I was going to be. I wasn't sure if I needed to be in a field outside of computers, which I loved so much and didn't want to ruin, 
or did I want to go fully into them, make them my vocation, learn them utterly, and use those skills to earn myself greater and greater salary and responsibility? And it was a struggle, because built into my character were these wonderful computers, and the thought that in some way I would turn them, just an earned paycheck, a simple set of tasks that I'd do for money, was hard to overcome. And when the video game startup I was part of had failed, I went into Unix administration, trepidatious, but matched up with a really great set of people, folks who were humans first and computer people second, who thought about weekends and family time and being yourself and having the freedom to live your own life before the job. In times hence, I've realized how unique that was and how it eased me into making computer administration my core income for 15 years. It turns out I like the feeling of working with others to make our environment run itself as well as possible, to not have to do the same things over and over just because it eats up time. And one side effect of that was that at this new job, I spent a lot of time on site. The network connection was incredibly fast for the time, and there were always new and interesting things to keep me awake. Some nights I would go home at midnight, but I'd spent the evening doing things for myself, downloading files, experimenting with projects, and connecting to whole ranges of folks. The world online, which I had enjoyed in tiny teaspoons in my teen years and small teacups in my twenties, was now opening up into almost unfathomable mouths. MP3s flying back and forth with music I would have never otherwise heard, websites expanding in every direction, containing amounts of bytes that I thought I would never see in my lifetime. Interesting stories, interesting hacks, and of course, communities that numbered in the tens of thousands that made the BBSs of my childhood seem, accurately, like they were one-horse towns. It was in this environment, this experimentation and access, that had led to textfiles.com and to the BBS list that would become the BBS documentary. The idea of putting together all sorts of different files and pieces of data from my childhood to provide to this seemingly infinite set of libraries that were going to be on the internet, that drove me in the realm of this work. And when I had gone home to see my family, it seems two forces were at hand. The first is that even with the humane and person-first thinking of the company I worked for, I was getting almost no sleep. Playing around with the online world was keeping me from a full night's sleep for weeks. And the other was that the life of my family, even one or two generations back, was so much more quiet, introspective, thoughtful that when I put my head down on this pillow, I was drowning myself in a riptide of calm. And that is how I slept for a day and a half. Here in my fifties, with much of my family of that generation gone, I'm not full of regret that I didn't spend more time with my family. I was happy with the directions that my life was taking, and I was finding out very quickly, what I wanted to be in the world. But now, in a life where I take walks and look for parks, stop and study trees and think about things internally before running to a keyboard, I have nothing but joy and respect that my family lived their lives the way they wanted to. And as I settle into an age more close to what they were at the time that I took my grandiose nap, I hope, ultimately, that my happiness will be theirs. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Josiah Lucier, Mark Pilgrim, 
James Bekoyanu, Emilio Oliveira, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Craig Talbert, Dileep Reddy, Sean Kelly, Trixie the Cat, John Sturm, Martin, Sembiance, Eugene, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Speaking of paths not taken, there's a story that I don't talk about much, but you might as well hear it. My mother had gotten divorced in her early 30s and had moved with her children to several homes until finally moving in with her parents. And that was why I could always find her there when I came home for holidays. And one day she got a letter. It was from a gentleman who remembered her from high school. And when I say remembered, I mean he had loved her from afar. He had utterly fallen for her. He had never married, he had never had children, and he was writing her because he wanted the privilege of taking her out on a date. After a short time thinking about it, she had accepted, and a date was set. And he never called. He stood her up. He ghosted her. She was annoyed, I'm sure, because this guy had talked a really good game about being such an admirer. And she called his number and he didn't pick up. And one day she called and got his family, who explained that in between her saying yes and their date, he had died. And in one way that was very sad. My mother never got her date. He never got the date with the girl of his dreams. But on the other hand, when his life had ended so early, it was thinking about the fact that he had taken that leap and reached out to this dream and asked for it to come true. And for the last days of his life, for one shining moment, his dreams were about to come true. If you were looking for an inspiration to take a chance, to take a leap, there it is. <laughs> 